very much for all of those that, that came on time. I know that many other folks are caught in famous Bay Area traffic. Uh, they'll be here shortly. Um, and on that line, to be respectful of everyone's time, we would, uh, we're would we going to be um, ringing a bell uh, just to let folks know when their time is coming to a close. Um, and uh, uh, just to remind everyone. So thank you all for coming. Um, with that said, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to invite our uh, CEO and President, Dr. Emmett Carson, who's going to say a few words. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, we're so glad to have you here. We're so glad to be holding this event uh, with the American India Foundation. It's, it's fabulous. We're so thankful uh, to have such a renowned speaker uh, with us today. Uh, I want to recognize Lada Krishna, who uh, uh, earlier this month was on a panel at our, our regional meeting talking about how donors give, has been a phenomenal partner, was on the board of one of our parent community foundations and remains a deep friend of, of the community foundation. Uh, people often have asked me, why is the community foundation increasingly doing work around India? What, what, what's that about? What's the motivation? And I've said, well, really, there are two motivations. The first is that the Indian community is a major part of our region. And for us to fulfill our mission as a community foundation means that we need to understand that community, understand the differences within that community, learn that community, build a level of trust and understanding, and over time work to help that community fulfill its interests within our community and the broader world. And toward that end, we produced a report on generations of giving that's at your seat. We've been meeting with, with various groups about how we can become more informed and more involved. And in some ways, this partnership is another aspect of trying to fulfill the goal that we think we own as a community foundation. The second reason is that we have more and more both individual donors to the community foundations as well as corporate partners who have operations in India who are giving to India through the Community Foundation. And to meet that need, uh, we were surprised recently uh, that the State Department named us as one of four organizations that they recommended to make gifts to India. We are developing a list of registered NGOs that people can go to to use, and these are already vetted, so we'll be able to make grants directly to those organizations in India and elsewhere. Today, our community foundation, uh, which has assets of $3.5 billion last year, uh, transacted about 10,000 grants to 30 countries. And India has about the third largest volume of our grants. Uh, to those countries. We're the third uh, largest processor in volume. We're the 15th largest international grant maker in the United States. So Gates is at the top, and your community <laughs> foundation here is number 15. And, and we're very <laughs> So our commitment to you is to continue uh, to learn from you, to partner with you, figure out how we can make the experience of your community better here within this community and facilitate your interests both across the country and around the world, including uh, India. With that, I'll stop. We're just so happy to have you here and introduce our, our partner, Inez Ravi uh, Kumar, who's the president of, of AIF, and we're so glad to to have this. Uh, we put our teams together and like instantaneously uh, they made greatness happen. So <laughs> we're so glad to be doing this together. Thank you all so much for coming. Right. Yeah, good evening. Absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, so thanks to Silicon Valley Community Foundation and Emmett. I uh, also want to recognize uh, uh, Stanford, Berkeley, Global Philanthropy Forum, and World Affairs Council. All of us got together and we uh, put this uh, uh, program together, so it's wonderful. Thank you. I want to introduce my team. There is Bhavna, Bhavna. there is Drew, and uh, Liz, Liz is outside. So they really worked hard along with the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the 
organization that I named. We're delighted to have Richard and thank you, sir. It's amazing. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, uh, later. Uh, so briefly, I want to talk to you about AIF. So I'm going to make it a simple format of, I'm going to ask questions to myself. I'm going to answer that. Simple questions as to who, we, who are we, what, what are we doing, who's our target audience, and what's so special about AIF, and what have we done till today? So the first question, who are we? We are a nonprofit. We were started in 2001 with a lot of help from President Clinton and the leaders of the Indian community and uh, Lata and yeah, thank you. <laughs> and Lata and Ajay and other leaders of the Indian community. Is this on? Yeah. 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 They all got together on the back of a terrible tragedy that happened in 2001 in India. 20,000 people died uh, because of a Gujarat earthquake. So that was the reason the leaders of the Indian community got together with a little bit of help from President Clinton. And quickly, what was formed is a nonprofit called the American India Foundation. That's who we are. Okay, what's our business? What are, we, what are we trying to do? It's a very simple thing we're trying to do. We are in the business of disrupting poverty in India. Easy to say that, but the amount of work that needs to go behind it is huge. And the next question is, how do we do that? How do we disrupt poverty? There are a lot of people who are doing this, and what's so special about what we are trying to do? First of all, we have chosen to specifically focus on four pillars, education, livelihood, public health, and leadership. These are the four pillars on which we have constructed whatever we are doing. And we have designed this with the inputs from experts on the ground. You know, Professor Amartya Sen is part of my uh, advisory council. We have experts in India who are part of a uh, board. Uh, and you know, uh, there's a lot of information you can get from the website, so I wouldn't go into it. So we have taken <coughs> inputs from all relevant people and designed specific signature programs. There are six signature programs that we do. So, so that's, what, that's how we do it. Uh, who's the target population? So if you're in the business <coughs> of you know, disrupting poverty, let's just focus a minute on that. There are 800 million people in India who are technically called poor. And there are 348 million of them who are called ultra poor. That's a little bit over the population of uh, uh, USA, right? And when, I, when you say ultra poor, you're talking about people who have 55 cents and below per day to take care of everything, to take care of their education, to take care of the food, to take care of the medicine, to take care of everything. So that's ultra poor. So that's the population that we are trying to work with. And the, I, I know Kabir is going to ring the bell, so just hold it. <laughs> <laughs> so what have we done till today? You know, I can stand here and talk about the work that Lata and uh, the rest of the team have <coughs> done till today. I'm, I'm mentioning them because I'm part of this journey only in the last one year. So I do not take credit for everything that has happened till now. So in the last 13 years, what has a American India Foundation achieved? So look at these numbers. These are metrics which are absolutely stupendous, in my opinion. And when I looked at it from outside, that's the, the, I'll, I'll finish with a personal story. I'll finish with a personal story which uh, uh, will say why I got attracted to AIF. But in the last 13 years, this group of people got together. They collected $84 million you know, donated by generosity of the folks in the US. Many of you are part of that. So that's a big number. That has been invested in India. It's been invested in 23 of the 29 states in India. And we believe in partnership. This is not a journey that you can do alone. So we have constructed 227 partnerships in this last 13 years, right? And the last important metric that uh, you need, you would want to know is the number of people whose lives have been positively impacted by American India Foundation. That's 1.95 million of, the, of India's poor. So those are the numbers. You know, and these are things uh, uh, that I looked at. I, I signed up to lead AIF uh, about a year ago. I'm finishing one year. And, uh, and there is a backstory as to oh, oh, why I thought of uh, leaving a 33-year uh, uh, career in uh, banking industry and to come to the nonprofit. 
and the backstory relates to my son posing a simple challenge when he was in, in a liberal arts college. He just came home one day and he posed a simple <laughs> challenge. <laughs> and he said, Dad, I'm sure you can do better. You're working in Citibank. I know you're doing great, but you could be a lot more useful. That's a simple <laughs> challenge he posed. And uh, long story short, I moved on. But before I moved on, I analyzed who are the people who are in the poverty disruption game with India. Right? There are, there are five or six institutions. So I did my due diligence. So I am absolutely amazed with what this group had done. Because what you want to do is to attack a problem smartly, and you want to scale it. There is no point in trying to do something which is going to help a, a smaller group of people. Because you're talking about 800 million people who need help. Um, so anyway, so scalability is something which this institution has done extremely well, and <coughs> sustainability. So what we don't want to do is to go into a place and keep running the same thing for the next 100 years. We want to do something, hand it over to a sustainable kind of process, and move on. OK, yeah, this time I heard. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to finish. So our goal is to go from 1.95 million to 5 million people in the next five years. That's our goal. And uh, what do I want from all of you? I want you to go to our website, read a lot more about what we are doing. Go talk about, if you like what we are doing, talk about it in your Facebook. Tell your friends about it. Join the movement. It's a movement. This is not, this is not for one person to do it. So I welcome all of you to join the movement. Thank you very much. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Gurcharan. You know, I, uh, there is so much you can, so this goes on to the next uh, timing period now. <laughs> <laughs> so my time will be <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So Gurcharan is someone, see I have studied in India, I've been to, uh, uh, I went to a good management institute in India. He's uh, an iconic figure in India. Uh, it'll take a long time to explain uh, that. Uh, but it's just amazing, you know, he is, uh, uh, he was extremely successful in the corporate world. He worked uh, in Procter & Gamble, he was the CEO, and uh, yeah, he went on from India to regional <coughs> positions, to international positions. He was looking at this strategy at a global level. And there was a point in time, and by the way, he's from, he did his philosophy from Harvard prior to, uh, prior to this. And there was a point in time he said, I'm going to change, you know, in India there is a, you've got cricket, you've got first innings, you've got second innings. He moved on to second innings so beautifully. You know, at a point of time he said, okay, I'm going to stop that and I'm going to do something. So in the new avatar, he is an iconic writer. He's an iconic commentator of what's happening in India. He's written some beautiful books. And uh, I, I, I saw one gentleman who came with all his books and said, can you please sign all the books? <laughs> some books. Uh, but the, the, the difficulty of being good is a fantastic book. If you haven't read it, please read it. Uh, but here, you know, we are here to talk about the new book, which is India Grows at Night. Uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, uh, book, but, uh, and, and today he uh, writes articles which gets published in numerous magazines and uh, newspapers, so, you know, Times of India, Newsweek, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, lots of them. Uh, so with that, uh, let me, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Gurcharan. Thank you very much. You do me honor by coming here uh, this evening. Uh, and let me begin just by saying that how uh, this place, Silicon Valley, has become such a beacon of inspiration for young people in India. The Bangalore was uh, in some ways a inspired by, by, by Silicon Valley. And um, the other thing that's very impressive is what we've just heard from these two fine gentlemen is the philanthropy of, 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 of the United States, which is now beginning to take hold in, 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 in India. And in fact, it's the, it's the Silicon Valley clones like Bangalore, which where it's emerging, such as Azim Premji and, uh, and other people. 
So, so it's very nice, really, uh, to be <coughs> at the home ground of, of, of it all. And I happen to be spending this semester at Berkeley, where I'm a writer in residence and a regents lecturer. But essentially all that means is I don't have to teach any courses. <laughs> uh, I have to just be there to work on my next book. And, uh, and what, why Berkeley? Because uh, one of the great Sanskrit scholars of the world is a professor, uh, Robert Goldman at Berkeley. And I knew some of the Western texts that I was interested in. But if I wanted to read the Sanskrit text, I had to come to Berkeley <laughs> to do it. So, and, and it is really, to some extent, the chair that he occupies is a, fun, is a reality because of the philanthropy of Indians in this community. And what strikes me is that now they just announced a new Jewish center of studies in Berkeley. They even just announced a Pakistan initiative. They've just announced they've had an Islamic studies center, a Chinese studies center. And I hope one day there will be an Indian studies center also uh, at Berkeley. And again, thanks to this wonderful spirit that you have in this. Well, that's not what I came to talk about. I came to tell you about my new book. And the best way to begin is to narrate the story of two towns which are in the, on the outskirts of Delhi, Faridabad and Gurgaon. 25 years ago, Faridabad was considered the future. It had an active municipal government. It had, a, it had a terrific industrial estate where investment was pouring in. It had rich agriculture. It had a direct rail connection to Delhi. And a state government that was determined to make this into the future of India. But And 25 years ago, the other place, Gurgaon, was a wilderness, a village, rocky soil, no industry, pitiable agriculture, even the goats ran away. <laughs> <laughs> Today, Gurgaon is the future. It has 27 shopping malls, five, seven golf courses, 32 million square feet, of commercial space which houses the world's largest corporations. It has fabled apartment complexes. And most importantly, it is, in fact, the engine driver of economic growth of the new India. <coughs> Faridabad today is still groaning under the weight of red tape officials, corruption, and it hasn't even experienced the first big change that happened to India after 1991. So what happened? Well, Gurgaon's disadvantage turned out to be an advantage. It had no government. In fact, it got, a <laughs> it got a municipality just two or three years ago, after it had blossomed. And therefore, there was no red tape, no officials to stop things. And it was a creation of self-reliant citizens who, when they did not get water, they dug bore wells. When police didn't show up, they put up private security agencies. They, when, when there was no electricity, they put private generators. If, if the school teachers didn't show up in government schools, they set up private schools. 
even in the slums where you where they charge four dollars a month in fees and so and so on health centers of the same kind so I think the new India is Gurgaon writ large it is a story of private success and public failure and people ask why do we need a government at all with corrupt politicians and unresponsive bureaucrats and so when we sip chai in India we very easily say India grows at night when the government sleeps now the last half of that I did not put on the title <laughs> <laughs> instead I put a liberal case for a strong state and that's what I really want to explain uh, what that is now to rise without a state as Gurgaon seemingly has done well it's a heroic thing it is brave but is it wise is it sustainable shouldn't India grow during the day and wouldn't Gurgaon be better off with a functioning drainage system with a with nice roads without puddles, with sidewalks, with parks, with libraries, with a decent public transport system. So therefore, both corrupt Faridabad, filled with red tape, and entrepreneurial laissez-faire Gurgaon are not the model for India's future governance. Faridabad would be happier with less corruption and Gurgaon would be happier with functioning services. With functioning services. It should not have to take 10 years in India to build a road. It should not have to take in India 10 years to get justice. And so this is why I wrote India grows at night and and this is and, 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 it, and what I'm trying to do is making a case for a strong liberal state. Now don't let the word strong put you off. We're not talking about Hitler's Germany or Stalin's Russia or Mao's China. The strong liberal state was the conception in the founding fathers minds of the United States as well as in India. And what is it? A, it's a state which has three pillars. One, it has an executive that can take quick, determined, decisive action when needed and does not have to face the kind of problems that Obama faces over Obamacare. <laughs> it has that action is bounded by the rule of law and that action is accountable to the people so those are the three pillars the ability to take determined action quick determined action when needed number two that action is bounded by the rule of law and three it's accountable to the people now that is the classical liberal State, a state that all democracies want to be and should be. Unfortunately, these three pillars do not reinforce each other like the pillars of this building. They sometimes undercut each other. Too much pressure for accountability undermines the state's capacity to act. And we have seen this with the Anna Hazare movement and all the, the, the RTE and so many things that we have done in the last so of the recent years, which have improved accountability but have reduced the capacity of the state. 
And so you need to strike a balance. And to, to achieve that balance, you really need to reform the institutions of the state. Now, there are too many books we read today about accountability. Very, nobody writes about state capacity. And, and I think that, that, that we put so much burden on the state Every time a new politician comes around, he wants a new program. Who has to administer it? The state bureaucracy or the, you know. The, the. And so this is what's happened as a result of democracy, as a result of socialism, which we had for 40 years. We, we wanted the state to be what we call the my bap state, the mother father state. And that state did everything. But we didn't give it the capacity to do it and hence the problems that we face. <coughs> Today, problems of corruption and, and, and the present slow down. The economy is a reflection that we may have hit a wall. <coughs> so how will we create such a state? Now, before we talk about how we will create such a state, let's pause and ask ourselves what kind of society we are, who we are in India. And the first thing to, that hits you is that this notion of private success and public failure that I'm talking about, <coughs> that India is a bottom-up success, unlike China, which is a top-down success. India is a success of the people, of its entrepreneurs, and China is a success of an amazing technocratic elite which runs the country. <coughs> I have a Chinese friend who comes, visits me. He's a big investor in India. And uh, uh, he's, his story is an amazing story, by the way. And I'll just take, maybe this will cut into my time. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I should be careful. But, and let me tell it, let me quickly tell you the story. He made a lot of money, but he forgot to share it with the party bureaucracy in the distant province of China. Suddenly his life was in danger. And so he was clever. He quickly spitted out his money and himself out of China, <laughs> landed in Hong Kong. In two days they found him in Hong Kong. He took a flight to Vancouver, where you were a few days ago. And in Vancouver, if you arrive with $250 million in <laughs> the bank, you get immediate residence. <laughs> <laughs> but a few weeks later, they had found him. So he felt again threatened, and he quietly bought a car and drove down to the United States and landed in California. And of course, if you land with that kind of money in the United States, you get a green card right away. <laughs> but again, a few months later, they found him. And he took a flight to Singapore. It is to the credit of Singapore's governance that they have not dared touch him there in Singapore. Well. One day, this fellow arrives at my house with a backache. He said, what happened? He said, your roads. <laughs> <laughs> How could you become the world's second fastest growing economy with this kind of infrastructure? <laughs> so he had been in Haryana looking at factories and uh, where he was going to invest. And so, let them sit down and then we continue. Mm -hmm. Sorry. OK. So when he said, how could you become the second fastest growing economy? So I told him that you know India grows at night. And he thought for a minute. And then he said, you mean? India has risen with one hand tied, and I nodded, 
and he said, you know, the nightmare of China's leadership should be, what if that second hand got untied? The, the mistake we make is to ask, when we talk about India and China, we will, we say, when we focus on who will get rich first, when we think of that race, well, both countries are going to turn into middle income, middle class countries. China is, a, is ahead, and it, it, it's ahead in income wise. But the real race is whether China will fix its politics first or India will fix its governance first. That country will win the race. And if neither does it, then both countries will fall into what economists call the middle income trap. Meaning they'll get stuck between 6,000 to $15,000 income. And they will not achieve what they think is their God-given right, which is to achieve the $40,000 US per capita income uh, at all. The other mistake we make is to believe that we, we believe that India has become, the state in India has become weak recently. India's always been a weak state and a strong society. Well, China has always been a strong state and a weak society. And the fact is you need both. You need a strong state to get things done. You need a strong society to make that state accountable. India's history was a history of empires. I mean, sorry, of kingdoms. While China's history was a history of empires. Even our four empires that we had in India, the Mughal, the, sorry, the Maurya, then the Gupta, then the Mughal, and then the British. All these four were weaker than the average Chinese empire. In China, the emperor gave the law, and then he interpreted the law. In India, the law, dharma, preceded the king, and the job of the king was to interpret dharma. And the interpreter of the law was not the king, but the Brahmin. So very early on, as early as the first kingdom, the Magadha, in 6th century BC, you had created a liberal division of powers which weakened the state. So oppression in India never came from the state. Where it, it always came from the state in China. Oppression in India came from society. And the answer to that oppression was the Buddha or the spiritual entrepreneur who came around every few years in, 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 in India. The Chinese are assimilators, Indians are accumulators, which is to say that the people who, people who came to China and to India, both came from Central Asia. In China, they were assimilated into one Han identity. In India, we accumulated them into 2,200 <laughs> jatis or subcastes. <laughs> so it's not surprising in 1947 that India became a democracy and China became a totalitarian state. And so today, India is rising from below and China is rising from the top. So that's, that is really a way to understand India. Uh, and so when we ask ourselves what is to be done, we should uh, bear this in background in mind of who we are. Well, if we are lucky, how do we get a strong liberal state? If we are lucky, we may have a strong leader who will emerge and who will be also a reformer a builder of institutions. <coughs> and democracies have had such leaders. I mean, we ourselves had Indira Gandhi. But Indira Gandhi was the wrong kind of leader. She was a destroyer of institutions. On the other hand, you, in, in, in England, in the early 19th century, was very corrupt. You could buy a seat in parliament. You could buy 
a job in any job in the government that if you had the money. But they did the reforms and they fixed it, but it took a hundred years to do it. Now we don't want to take a hundred years. There's no silver bullet. However, my hope is with the new middle class. This is a group of people, you know, India is a young country. 40% of India did not exist in 1991. And so today, this group has come out. They've been awakened by the Anna Azadeh movement. They're very angry. They have risen by their own bootstraps. They see how they've come up, and they see how the politicians and officials have come up. And, 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 and they are not going to stand for it. <clears throat> so this is today, if you add the people, what I call the new middle class, and if you add what I call the people, would be aspiring, new aspiring middle class, you have a third of India. By 2020, you will have half of India. So politics has to change. And in fact, I think 2014 is going to show some surprises to us. So what, what, what do we need to do? These young people, first of all, have to vote. And secondly, they have to do what Tocqueville told, the, the great, I think the greatest book on democracy was written by Alexis de Tocqueville, Democracy in America. And what Tocqueville's inspiration was he saw the success of America was not its prosperity, but was the community. What's the word here? Community. Right. And that community consisted of spending time in your neighborhood. Europeans were not doing that. And he was writing to the, for the Europeans. But so, I'm l lucky now, after this book, I get a chance to speak to young people, this new middle class. Every week, I'm giving two or three talks, and I tell them one hour a week. That's the lesson of Tokpi. Begin with one hour a week spending on your neighborhood. When you do that, when neighbors meet, what do they talk about? Condition of the schools, of the lights on the road, the puddles on the ground. And that's how real politics, that's the real genius of democracy. So we've, we've, got to, we've got to start doing that. The second thing is <coughs> the fact that one of the reasons why we have this problem of the rule of law in India and corruption is that Indians, most Indians think the constitution kind of fell out, fell down from heaven. And still have five minutes. It, it, it fell down from heaven. They don't think it's theirs. The Americans are told every day. They're obsessed in school, everywhere. You're talking about the Constitution. It's ours. We the people. Now in India, we had a wonderful, we have a very good Constitution. And the people who were engaged in creating that Constitution our founding fathers, they knew they were doing, it was a moral project, nation building. In fact, they were so imbued with that, that they put the wheel of dharma, of, of morality, into the flag of the constitution, to do the right thing. The, the line is, satya mev jayate, truth will prevail. Now, but, you know, nation building is myth building, myth making. And the last person who did this was Gandhi. Ga nobody after Gandhi, after he died, unfortunately he died in 48, soon after the independence. Nobody has sold the constitution in the language of the people. Nehru, Nehru's language was too elitist, westernized, liberal. Harrow, Cambridge. Gandhi fought untouchability. 
the notion of equality through the notion through dharma he fought for freedom liberty through dharma so this dharma project needs to take place and this is one of the things that i feel is a need finally the third need is that here it is a country which gives enormous political liberty to its people you will have more political liberty in india than you know you've got a press you've got a television networks you have 120 news channels of course in all the languages 24 by 7 and yet you have an, you've got amazing religious freedom you got amazing religious freedom kabir i have three more minutes <laughs> and uh, but the can this country with amazing political and religious liberty cannot give its people economic liberty and therefore reforms are done by stealth and therefore people have begun to believe that reforms are about making the rich richer and the poor poor nobody has gone out to sell the reforms nobody has made the distinction that there's a difference between being pro market and pro business that pro market means that you stand for competition competition helps lower costs lowers prices raises quality of products and leads to a rules based capitalism whereas <coughs> being pro business means you retain power in the state to give out licenses and therefore you have crony capitalism now so for people believe that capitalism is crony capitalism that there is no honest capitalism and this is because you have not sold the idea of economic liberty now that's why one of the planks of my book is that we need a classical liberal party in india which will do these three things that i have talked about and which will be single mindedly determined to institutional reform the one we talked about as well as economic reforms which in fact by themselves reduce corruption and make for a robust polity lest you feel that i have left you somewhat depressed <laughs> <laughs> let me say that this project of mine began in fact in tahrir square in egypt i was invited by the democracy movement to speak on the future of egypt and present india's model for egypt and the egyptians asked me three questions one how did you keep the generals out of power i said well you know we've never asked this question for 65 years <laughs> and they said you know you don't realize you've come a long way because every democracy that wants to be a democracy every country wants ask that question second question was they said that the christians of egypt coptic christians feel in their 11% and they feel insecure the muslims in india are 13% but they feel secure in india now and they are the least radicalized islamicized muslims in the world how did you do that and again i was surprised i said i didn't think of india as a great secular achievement I had thought of the Gujarat riots in 2002, the Sikh riots in 1984, but they said you don't, you're too close. You don't, you haven't seen Islam around the world. Number third question they asked: How did you get that outsourcing business <laughs> <laughs> so that we can also do that and start doing? Now I tell this to you in concluding my talk. because i really do want to put the project that we have to do in india in perspective i think the rise of india has been the defining event of my life and 
The fact is at a time when the Western world is searching their souls for a model of, of asking what has gone wrong with their capitalism, you have a country rising in the East based on the classical principles of economic and political liberty. And so I would say this, the rise of India is something that's good for the world. So let me thank you on that note. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Pradeep Chibber in just a second. Before that, I, uh, I wanted to, to make two mentions very quickly. One, uh, I wanted to thank our, our, uh, our musical hosting organization, uh, the San Francisco World Music Festival. They uh, generously came out. <laughs> and uh, I also wanted to call out, I saw some guests trickling in as I snuck out to get a bite to eat. And uh, I was wondering where they came from, and I thought, oh, typically uh, arriving very late. It turns out they made the journey all the way from Sonoma. So wow. I did want to say thank you, because I know you probably love that. So Pradeep Chibber, uh, thank you very much. Professor Chibber is the Indo-American Community Chair in India Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Chibber received an MA and MPhil from the University of Delhi and a PhD from UCLA. He studies the politics of India, political parties, and party systems, and has written extensively about the topic. Please join me in welcoming Pradeep for a lively discussion and a Q&A. Hi. Okay, so I get the enviable task of dealing with this. <laughs> ah. So the question is, Gocharan, should we be the argumentative Indians, or should we be the <laughs> polite Indians? <laughs> <laughs> so let me start by um, just, uh, first I think it's a great book to read, it's very erudite and it's uh, a pleasure to read. I unfortunately can't get an autographed copy because I have one, on one of these devices, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but the reason I, let me begin by talking about the three, the first project you want to, you, issue you raise in your book is institutional change. Right? And we'll get to the value change in a moment. And the institutional change you're suggesting is a strong executive bound by the rule of law, accountable to the people. Now if you ask a conservative American, or even the American who has imbibed the value systems of the American Constitution, they look at you and say, that presidential model hasn't worked anywhere. And the genius of government is the Madisonian genius, which is do nothing, or to prevent the government from doing anything. Well, uh, I, first of all, I'm not necessarily advocating a presidential system for India. Mm -hmm. I think even a Westminster model or a parliamentary system can be <coughs> more effective. And we have seen it effective in many, many many countries. Um, I do believe that we need the state. And and I don't think, I think maybe you're saying this in jest, but uh, the do-nothing government is also not the answer. Clearly, you need a state. And you need a state, and, and I would say, a state that will at least uphold the minimal functions. Now, I personally would go beyond those minimal functions, but law and order, etc. Even in the Mahabharata, as early as that time, <coughs> uh, in the epic, Yudhishthir, who wants to renounce the throne, he is given a lecture by Bhishma, and he's told that, look, I'm sorry, the, the reason Yudhishthir wants to leave the throne is after the war, he has seen so much killing that he feels so repugnant at, by the public sphere completely, and he wants to become an ascetic. That's good Indian way of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that he's told, he's told that power, power, the monopoly of power resides in the state. 
And the job of the state is to ensure that it protects the weakest individual. And, and therefore, the state is needed and power in the state is needed. I completely agree with you, and let me push that a little bit. So we said you need a state with power, and that raises two issues. The one issue we discussed on the right here, which is the issue of state capacity. Right? And we talked a little bit about that. And since then, I've got my facts. <coughs> and I emailed somebody to get some numbers. I don't remember numbers anymore. So let me see if I remember these numbers now. Just to give you some context to this, the India central government has 257 employees for every 1 lakh 100,000 individuals. How many does the US have? 840. Right? Wow. India has, if you take out the railways, India has only 125 employees for every 100,000 citizens. And if you include all government, India has 1,622 employees for 1,000, 100,000 individuals, but the US has 7,681. Right? So if we are talking of a state, no, no, I agree with you. So are we then advocating that if the state is actually to work, we actually need to make the state in India much larger? OK, that's a very good question, especially in this country where it's so polarized on the bigness of the state. Uh, I think in India's case, you, you do need more capacity. More capacity, you probably need more people also. <coughs> but more capacity also means smarter working. The technology now allows you to do so much more. E-governance will create so much, uh, m much more functioning, uh, uh, functioning state. But the issue is that you need also it's not just the quantity of people, uh, Pradeep. It's the quality. It means systems. Right. Systems of the state today in India are 19th century system of files moving from person to person. And they and, still get lost. And they still get lost. <laughs> There's a scandal in the prime minister's office. They lost files on this major allocation of code. Right. So, yes. so I think <coughs> what you need is, yes, state capacity. But that doesn't necessarily automatically mean a bigger state. It will mean, today, you're right, like judges, policemen, they, you need much more of that. But you need much more technology in the courts. You need much more technology in police stations that can do much more forensics the, uh, the, that we see in Law and Order, <laughs> that TV show. <laughs> So that is being smart, the smart state. And so the reforms we need are reforms of the bureaucracy, the police, the judiciary, and work methods that you need to introduce the very best work methods. And you, I, I don't think you need to have as many people in the government as you have in the United States. No, we don't know that because the US government, compared to the Indian government, works. Right? Now, some people may think it's dysfunctional, but for most common citizens, it can actually deliver. It's, it's a matter of some contention, but it's yeah. something what But I think the better model this issue in this audience. Is, the better model is the Scandinavian countries. They have even you more. See, no, but they, they, are, they have in the last few years introduced a huge amount of technology. Yes. And this has made a big difference. Yeah, so let me. So uh, we are in Silicon Valley, so I mentioned it. <laughs> let me get to This is a slight segue, but you know, a student of mine did some interesting work on technology and all these e governance initiatives. And the, I'm going to segue into the private sector in a moment, but she found something really interesting that while the standard government shop was more inefficient, she found that the level of e governance, the private sector operated e governance shacks, were equally corrupt, which means the amount of money that a person had to pay did not change. So you know, the question we need to ask ourselves is, is technology really the answer? Depends on what you're trying to solve, but if you're trying to get rid of the issue of the capacity of the state and corruption, will this <coughs> capacity? Well, I can give you a number of examples where 
the use of technology has reduced corruption and in, in my life. I can tell you now I, buy, I can buy a railway ticket online and I know my seat number. And before, you used to have to stand in a mile long queue and then you had to bribe somebody in the, the, yes. uh, in, in the, in the train. Now that's all. In fact, the, the most lucrative job were the ticket collectors in the railways. Their union was the most powerful. Now it's the least powerful union of all because they don't make any money. And so this way, in terms of driver <coughs> license, driver license renewal, you don't have to bribe. There are many, many other ways that the e-government does, 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 does help. Now, I don't want to overrate the place of technology. But I do want to say, when you compare the private sector to the public sector, that yes, I'm sure there is corruption in the private sector. But by God, you know, in, I mean, I ran Procter & Gamble in India. And it was somebody's money. When you work in the government, it's no one's money that you're dealing with. And so we had instituted such controls on corruption. The, that is, the people who were shareholders wanted those kind of controls. I mean, I'm on the board of Air India. And the reason I've joined the board of Air India, by the way, is because I've told the minister that I'm going to fight for the privatization of Air India. The Air India costs uh, the country billions of dollars yes. every year. And it used to be in the late 50s, early 60s, the best airline in the world. Today it's one of the worst. And so chances are, Pradeep, while things can be terrific in the public sector also, I mean, but it's very hard for a public sector airline in the end to compete against the private sector here. I think that I think all that is fair, but let me push this idea of the private sector versus the public sector a little bit. And you understand why I'm doing this, because this is no. private sector central, right? So I'm just going to play a little bit of a devil's advocate for the moment. It's from Berkeley. Yeah, I'm from Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to live up to my lefty <laughs> credentials, sir, right? Sir, it's not <laughs> about Air India. Air <laughs> Marshal Ram Das did survive. Can we, let, we'll, we'll open it up to it. I want to interrupt, because I happen to belong to that clan. Why did you not survive? We will, we'll, we'll take this up. Come on. So let me ask you this question about, so the Indian private sector, and I'll give you a story. And I want us to take pause after that for a moment. So typical Indian style, I had a relative who needed a job. So I asked a colleague of mine, I was teaching in Delhi. I said, could we get him a job? He got him a job in his firm, which he was running on the side. Mm -hmm. So. The guy got a job in the firm, and his boss would actually make him sit on the floor and abuse him. Sit on the, the floor. floor and abuse him. Now, and I'm, and this is an isolated example, but I have lots of relatives, to use that example, who work in small companies in India, really small firms. And most of, most of my relatives, for good luck or bad luck, are not very successful people, so they're mostly fixers. Their job is to run interference with the state. So all your stories of corruption are absolutely right. I can sympathize with them. I can empathize with them. But the parts that are missing to me is the fact that within the private sector itself, large swathes of the private sector, the amount of hierarchy and capriciousness that exists is phenomenal. Why do people want a government job? Why do people want a job in Procter & Gamble? You know, even at the lowest level. For a very simple reason, that much of the fact that's growing in the night, right, is growing in the night because it has lots of things to hide. Pradeep, I'll tell you, this is a very nice story. But you haven't, I think, uh, India in the last 20 years has changed from this kind of uh, story that you're telling. The reason it's changed is because it's become competitive. And frankly, Today, if you get somebody sitting on the floor and start abusing them, that fellow is going to get up, walk out, and go to the competitor. And you, if that fellow is good, you're going to suffer. So 
the, the fact is that if you don't, in a competitive market, if you don't treat people well, they will leave. And when you have an 8% rate of growth of your economy, you are creating millions of jobs every year. And so, this was all right during License Raj, pre-91. But the Indian economy, the private sector, is unrecognizable. Even I, who left uh, and became a writer from 94, end of 94, even I don't recognize this private sector. And this, you cannot be a globe. India has produced about 25 globally competitive companies in the last 25 years. And another 25 will be globally competitive in the next few years. And this Chinese friend of mine, he invests in the third 50 of those companies because he thinks they are the future. Now, what I'm trying to say to you is that in a competitive market, you know one of the most scarcest thing that any <coughs> businessman will tell you in India is scarcity of people. But you say, oh, but God, God, there are 1.2 billion people. Why is everybody, this is what an American came to see. And this Chinese fellow said the same thing. Why does every American farmer, I mean Indian farmer, Indian businessman, what does he complain for? I don't get people. <coughs> the people you deal with in Silicon Valley in India, that's what they tell you. So talent in every society is scarce in a competitive society. It's at a premium. Nobody can afford to do the kinds of things that it, it catches up. And it's not a cultural issue either. Well, we can let that one pass. Okay. <laughs> uh, because I'm speaking from personal experience, even, even in contemporary India, which is, you know, these are these really small guys running hotels, <coughs> running schools. Yeah, but, you know, uh, but there are both sides to it. And I think it's something we should take pause and think about. I wish I had the nerve, I'll be honest with you, to study the workings of the Indian private sector at the local level. Not at the big firms you're talking about. That's a completely different kettle of fish. And you, you're finding this actually even in China from people who've done work, that the presence of foreign firms actually has an impact right. on the performance the local of the local companies, right? But so that's You know what the impact McDonald's had in China? The Chinese restaurants got very angry when McDonald's come, came, because as soon as McDonald's would arrive, the Chinese people expected a higher level of bathrooms, of toilets, right. in the Chinese restaurants. The, and the people, that the, the, they, the, they found out that it was not a fast food place, a McDonald's. Women came and sat for hours because they felt much more secure in a brightly lit McDonald's than in a Chinese restaurant. So, uh, Moving away from the private sector, let's get back to the second issue you talked about, which is value change. <coughs> right. And how do we suppose this value change you anticipate will come about? And the reason I ask it is the following. Uh, this is again, you know, just to push this idea a little bit, that at one level, think of the Indian bureaucracy or the Indian court system. I have a colleague of mine who just did a study of the Indian courts, of how courts work at the local level. And he presented his findings to the high court, to his friends in the high court. They got mad with him because he was advocating giving more authority to the district court judges. Indian district court judges maybe can adjudicate cases on facts, but they can't interpret the law at all. And in fact, the high courts will take on the authority of not only reviewing the case on case law, but also actually reinterpreting the facts and re examining the factual basis of the law. So when he presents it to these high court judges, and there's a reason I'm asking this value change question, the response was, these lower club, these lower court people are incompetent. And so the question for you is, how do we institutionalize this value change in an extremely hierarchical society? where the middle level, top middle level bureaucrat, the middle level, top level judge is not willing to devolve. I'm Before glad you asked this question, Pradeep. Um, because I have a view that is different from what most people believe in. Sure, culture matters, values matter. 
But what we have to realize is how quickly culture and values can change when governments change. The same Indians who cross the immigration line at SFO and come and work in Silicon Valley, they stop at the red light. They don't try to bribe the police. They pay their taxes. <laughs> they pay their taxes. How? You, how come? And the, these are the same people who the day before were doing all this. How can culture and values change overnight? We had a, outside my house I live on uh, in, 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 in Delhi, and uh, there was a, there was, there's, a tra there's a pedestrian crossing outside near my house. And because it's a pedestrian crossing and because it's a, a flashing light, you have to be very careful. <laughs> And they actually then changed the flashing light to a proper red light and green light. But people didn't change. And they kept going the same way. So you have to be very careful. Then the, they put a policeman near the light, a little bit ahead of the light. And, and they put the policeman there only for three days. And the fine was 500 rupees if you went through the red light. Well. After three days, Pradeep, culture changed. <laughs> For the last three years, no one dares to go through the red light. So culture changes. So I would not worry people who say, oh, but Indians are corrupt. That's a showstopper in a cocktail party. <laughs> There's nothing else to talk about after that. <laughs> Whereas that lets governance off the hook. That lets the state off the hook. What we need to do is to chain institutions, <coughs> to put policemen at red light, to make an... So one of the things that's failed us is enforcement. Yeah. It's, it's, it's straightforward enforcement. And that's what I always tell my friends who bring up this issue of culture and values. Values change faster. It will be easier to change values in India than it will be to get uh, the proper governance reform that we need. I think my time is up. Yeah. See, it's perfect. <laughs> Seven twenty. <laughs> Floor is open for questions. Yes, sir. So, do you have an answer? Yes. <laughs> I'm Abhishek. I live in the Mountain View city, which is very close by. And I must say, first of all, excellent talk. It was really inspiring to hear you speak. Um, I have a question. I, I agree with most of what you said. I have a question about one particular statement that you talked about in an area related to that. So you made a statement that if India and China are not wise and careful, they will fall into the middle income trap. And they will miss the vote of the $40,000 US. So given the ancient cultures that both of these countries have and how we've always seen balance as something that is so enforced in all these cultures, like China has uh, yin and yang, and India has like uh, this enforced in so many ways, are we setting a wrong goal for ourselves? Because we've seen the goal of getting to $40,000 has a huge opportunity cost in some sense, and you're kind of sacrificing something else. And if you ask people here, that goal of $40,000 or greed in some core level sense does not really achieve everything that you need to be a successful nation. So are we undermining the, or uh, undervaluing the definition of success by calling it $40,000? Very fair question. Um, and uh, I, I personally, uh, I don't address such an issue in this book because my main concern is, is much more immediate, which is to get governance fixed. And frankly, to real happiness in society requires a level of predictability for human beings. When you walk out of the house, you want to be able to predict that you will be able to cross the street, that nobody will come and snatch 
your wallet. You need various things of predictability. And governance is about that predictability. So I would just say, let's take first things first. The first thing is to get good governance. And Miss people criticize the United States around the world. And they criticize for being consumerist. They criticize for many, many things. But they don't, they forget that the, when, I, when, we, when we moved into Mountain Valley, Mount, as Mount View, <laughs> right. when, the, when we came to Mountain Valley, I told Pradeep that, look, you know, it's very attractive and, and so on. And I said, but it's not the prosperity, I said, that, in, that impresses me. It is the fact that the traffic is flowing smoothly, there are lights on the street, the roads are smoothly paved, there's probably garbage has been collected from wherever <laughs> garbage is collected. And that is the kind of governance that I'm talking about. So while I agree with you, the long goal mm -hmm. may not be $40,000. But let's get this part sorted out. Yes, sir. Okay. Maybe just a small quibble. You know, you've, you've talked about the three uh, pillars. Pillars. You know, but it seems to me the uh, uh, the rule of law it is actually the, the the only thing that's actually missing in India. You, you know, when you talk about accountability, even the right information, etc. It's really not asking the government to be responsible to the people. They're simply asking government officials to follow the law, I think. You know. And for the law to be enforced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, so we have, you, have it, you have all the laws, but you know, sometimes I say, India has law, but China has order. <laughs> but you need both law and order. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're right. And, and, and uh, to strengthen, that's exactly the basic, why I say India should grow during the day. The basic need for us is to come back <coughs> to the fundamentals. And, and that's state capacity. And what we, have, what we don't have, we don't have, well, we don't have good enforcement. We don't have good enforcement partly because we don't have enough judges and policemen, but also our systems are poor, and, and it's not a question of values, again, it's a question of reforms. There are ways, society, you know, human beings are much more similar than they are different. We make the mistake in thinking <coughs> that human beings, Indians are like this, the Japanese are like this, the Americans are like this. No. These are very superficial differences. Our basic motivations are very similar. So if you, if you create systems which have incentives that are, that, are, that are working in other societies, they will work, chances are they will work in every society. So that's really, I mean, you, you paraphrased uh, what, and this is actually what I said in Tahrir Square. Actually, it's on YouTube if you want to hear <laughs> me talking to 30,000 Egyptians brain for Mubarak's blood. <laughs> this is, I talked about the rule of law and they totally lost interest. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Christian Stephenson. And thank you again for being here and giving this talk. So um, I'm from Scandinavia and you know, I'm all in favor of growing the government in India and certainly growing also the, the service level provided by the government in India. Um, however, there is a, a high level of corruption, and then in the context of very high corruption, growing the government seems like a very scary proposition all of a sudden. And I think you've alluded to at least one way of addressing this. You said, well, technology, now I can book my train ticket online, and this is all great, but it doesn't seem to me that that entirely addresses the, the question of how do we grow the government while at the same time there is a problem of corruption. So could you talk a little bit more about how you well, might I, that? I thought, I mean, that was Pradeep that asked the same question. And maybe I didn't do a good job of answering it. 
But essentially, when we say grow the government, what I'm saying is growing the capacity of the government doesn't mean increasing numbers only. In some cases, it does mean increasing numbers. But precisely what I'm talking about are the reforms. You see, if you're a civil servant, in the, the typical civil servant in India, he is, he gets a promotion at the end of a certain number of years. And his promotion is based on what is called seniority, the number of years of service. It's not related to performance. So whether it's your, the, inc the increase in your salary or your promotion, whether you perform or you don't perform, you get it, regardless. Now, Sounds like a good system to me. <laughs> now, if you have a system like that, then there is no motivation. For, and people, in, about 20, 25% of the people in India work very hard. Yes. They're keeping the whole place afloat. But they're not rewarded. They get the same, they, they're not saying that, look, if you, since you performed well, you'll get promoted first. But, but that's the kind of reform. No, but you should talk about the other fact which we talked about in the car, which is following up on this. So, for example, he said to me in the car, a district collector in India, the guy who runs the county, has 87 schemes he or she is running in addition to being the chief law and order person, in addition to be doing land acquisition, and in addition to doing everything else. So this is state capacity. Mm -hmm. So, so if I understand you correctly, you're saying that uh, by having a more in incentive uh, and performance-based system within the government, yeah. that would, as a side effect, reduce corruption over time. That's right. Like the police. The police should have an autonomy. Today, the chief minister in a state can transfer any policeman anywhere. Now, so there's no system whereby that there should be a proper review of the guy's performance. By his, by his boss and by others, and he gets, and he, he, he grows on that basis. So you need to insulate, you need to create professionalism. Things that every, any functioning organization has to do. Okay. Just a second, you had a question there. There you are, yeah. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for a lovely chat and conversation. Um, well, my name is Manita, and I have uh, worked in India with various international development organizations and stuff. My question is with you with regards to capacity. When we talk about capacity, how do we strengthen the capacities of the government officials? Well, while working with the United Nations as an officer, we used to assist government officials to develop basic, you know, uh, program minutes or basic program planning. We used to be supportive, but my really my major concern is as an IS officer, as a public servant, that official in a government structures is able to understand those programs and you know, the broad implementation strategies, but how do we strengthen the capacities of all those materials uh, from the grassroots level with the, you know, Anamari worker, the ashas, you know, at the village level, those yeah. rural functionaries, at district level, those yeah. officials who are working at there, how do we percolate those kind of learnings in, the, in such a wide and diverse society? That's a very big challenge, I see. If I can hear your views on that. Right. That's well, it's, it's the classic challenge of management, isn't it, at the end of the day? I mean, the, the problem in India is not of politics. It's actually very much a problem of creating a performing institution, which happens. I mean, companies get turned around. There are companies which become very uh, lazy. They become, there's the wrong sort of uh, things happen. But then a new management comes in and is able to turn them around. Now, the government's a much more complex task. But fundamentally, the idea is the same, that you create those, create that professional spirit through the reforms. And by the way, the ideas that reforms that have to be done, everybody knows from 1960 onwards, there have been administrative reform commissions in India. Dozens of 
commissions have taken. And they've all said the same thing. Like one I, the example I just gave to you about promotion. That you promote people on performance, not on seniority. It hasn't happened. So it's not an easy thing to do. You know, it's not an easy thing to do, but it can be done. Now I'll give you a name which is a very polarizing name. People at Berkeley will hate that person. <laughs> and people at Silicon Valley would perhaps love that person. And that was a woman called Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher, we think of her as a person who is basically pro-market. But actually she had a much bigger impact in reforming the British state. The kind of reforms, institutions, bringing accountability to civil servants, not having, changing this promotion from seniority to a performance, that was under her. These are the kinds of things, they can happen, but you need a tough kind of person like her to, to do it and was willing to be unpopular because the 80% who are enjoying these things, they won't, they don't like it. Okay, we have time for three questions, so we'll take three more. Yes. I'm a big commander of Mormon Road, I've been to serve in the defense and the HR in the civil So, sir, I thought, constitutes with the main framework, executive legislation, and everybody swears by it. But in this country, the amendments are only 26 and around. And that's 200 years old country. The whole thing trickles down from that Bible of administration. Everyone swears by it. You come to India in a matter of 50 years, three times so amendments have come. In the Prime Minister didn't like Mumbai, she sat in post emergence. Now, a question, the uh, other thing you talked of culture. 30 years of independence, I saw in the Indian railways, Indian style, such insult, offensive, no matter the any of the country, I visited about maybe 30 countries. You won't see an American, American style. What have, what's the wrong with the railways? The railways, they mark the Indian bathroom. style bathroom. Yeah. Indian style, British as Goravalas, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I didn't mean any offense. When they were ruling, they ruled so well, Nobody found it amiss till I wrote of the railway board. So what's the problem with an Indian problem, style bathroom? How could you identify it? it's an insult? That is for their country. I'm sorry, I disagree with you totally. I, 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 so I, let me just tell you first of all. Do you see American style here? Yeah. yeah. I, what, I, no. Frankly, it's, if, it's, if some people are comfortable in a particular I'm way, I'm not saying to provide Let them that, give sir, them the I, choice. I'm only talking about the board. I'm What's wrong know. with that? Like you're basically identifying huh. that there are two styles of so toilets. Yeah, yeah, but what difference? I mean, people in yeah. India use both ways. Yeah. Slavery. They, they I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I cannot yes. agree with you I, at all on this. Point. Actually, he raises an interesting point about the constitution, which is the issue of constitutional oh. yes. Why don't you, Pradeep, uh, answer that one? That's a good one. I'll answer that one. And the reason is that the American constitution is actually, in the Indian constitution is also a policy document. The American constitution is not a policy document. And we must keep that in mind. An analogy would be, you know, or, you know, the state of Alabama, the U.S. has a constitution, and it literally legislates that every time there's a red light, you know, it is a constitutional amendment. You know, bad joke, right? But if you have a policy document, which is what the Indian constitution is, any time you need to change policies, there is a constitutional amendment. So the question is, how many of these constitutional amendments are actually real amendments to the constitution, the core of the constitution? There may be one or two or three, maybe, right? But the number of amendments is a lot because most of those amendments are actually policy amendments. So for a, that's a huge difference we need to keep in mind. That the core structure of the Constitution hasn't been altered. That exactly. Much. And I think that it's very easy. These are the superficial things that we latch on to when the real issues are much more, much deeper. Yes, Ravi. Yeah. Um, so you told us about how India is growing at night right now, and you're very optimistic about India growing in the day also in future. What role do you see for independent sector or not-for-profit sector or civil society in that movement? 
Okay, that's a very, very good question. And, and frankly, you know, my starting point of my talk <coughs> was that we are a strong society and a weak state. And therefore, as that strong society, the traditional society in India, was the society of the village, the caste, and the joint family, these three. Now that society is evolving and is evolving into a modern <coughs> civil society with partly with economic, with, with the market capitalism, you, you are having a, an impact, a very profound impact on that society. And today, what is most interesting is that the civil society movement is flourishing, while the private sector also is flourishing but simultaneously with it. And civil society is quite powerful, almost too powerful in certain respects, you, can, you could argue. Uh, and so I see a very real, a very, very good future for it. That, that it, it's a, it's, it's, <coughs> democracy has allowed the, 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 the flourishing both of the private sector as well as of civil society. I mean, this is the way, short answer. Thank you. This will be the last question. I'm sorry I see a lot of hands up. Um, after this, Gurcharan will be doing a book signing just over there, so please do stay around and we'll bring in some, some wine and some sweets. Thanks, I'm really privileged to ask the last question. <laughs> um, I agree with you on one other point that you made, which is uh, starting with community which I think uh, has the potential to make a tremendous uh, difference uh, in uh, improving Indian society. Um, one thing that I'm finding a little bit uh, challenging to uh, accept is that uh, the strong government, India needs a strong government, or I think it's- Strong state. Strong state. So how would you- Strong reconcile state like Scandinavian yeah. states, United States, UK. Correct. How do you reconcile to certain facts which um, I may be kind of maybe quoting a little bit loosely, but uh, I may not be far off from the actual reality, which is that. Uh, um, take one example. Um, I'm going to take this uh, spectrum scandal, which um, say one of the South Indian ex chief minister's daughter was uh, alleged to amassed in cahoots with other central ministers to the vast sum of billions of dollars. I mean, we talk about, I mean, I understand, I understand, you know, you're talking about small corruptions here and there, but when you talk about, I mean, there is also, you know, commonly somewhat accepted fact, I don't know whether it is a fact or not, close to a trillion dollars supposed to be in Swiss bank accounts. So that's, that's to me, is a huge problem, not, uh, you know, the signals or, I mean, I understand those things are all problems which need to be addressed. And I think, okay. gonna I think I've got, I've got your point. And first of all, a lot of these numbers, are, the press loves to inflate numbers, just as our CAG has done. And trillions of dollars is absolute rubbish. And the, but still, it's, the real issue is the one, not of numbers, but of these, these actions. Now, it's ironical that the most reformed sector in India was the telecom sector. I mean, if one thing defines India's story is the story of the telecom, of, of, of the revolution of the cell phones. <coughs> India is the country with 900 million cell phones, almost more than any consumer product. <coughs> Everybody has a cell phone. And, and yet, the biggest corruption scandal occurred in this <laughs> very sector <clears throat> when you basically, liberals like me, reformers, believe that the answer to corruption is to do more reform. So here, in the case of the spectrum, everything got reformed except the government held the, had the power to give out the spectrum which you use to talk to each other. And 
you could easily have said at that point that, look, why should the government dole out spectrum to companies individually? Why can't it be like a tax that everybody pays, like one cent <coughs> every one minute phone call or 10 minute phone call, you pay one cent as tax for using the spectrum, which goes back to the government to maintain the spectrum. So the more you talk, the more you pay, the more a company use, gets market share, the more spectrum it gets automatically. So why should anybody have any discretion on the giving away of spectrum? It should be like the commons. You know, the economists talk about the commons. And, but here, a crooked minister, and you gave the example of his party and the, the, the lady, uh, he decided to uh, give spectrum in a non-transparent way. He could have done an auction, could have done other ways that you can do with the rule of law. So here was a crook. And um, the fact of the matter is that what failed, again, was the, were the institution that if you had laid out a very clear formula in advance for this, rather than you, if you had, basically economic reforms are about taking discretion out of the hands of individuals in the government. And that had not taken place. So I, it's not a question of culture. It's not a question of a particular, uh, okay? It's a question of an institutional failure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who haven't purchased a book, they are available for sale outside. And Gurcharan will be over here uh, signing books. Thank you all for coming.